Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Good, morning. good to be back behind this piece of furniture. <laughs> Brevard, bless you. Well, it is Palm Sunday, and we know this story well, but we don't know it as well as the king who came intends for us to know it. So I'm going to read from Matthew's account of Palm Sunday, of Jesus coming into the city, and then we're going to read a few more extra verses from the Old Testament reading that uh, Becky read earlier from Zechariah chapter 9. So if you have a scripture or a good set of ears, listen to the word of God for the people of God. Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 10. Matthew's account of this magnificent day that begins our Holy Week. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there and her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? Let's pray once again over that very question. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the gift to Darlene and myself to be here in the company of old friends and new friends. Lord, thank you for, Lord, uh, now pushing three decades of your great faithfulness in this community called Christ Community. Lord, uh, you have done for years and years and years exceedingly beyond all we could ask or imagine and in such a fashion that no man or group of people could ever take credit for what has pleased you to do in this church. Thank you that that legacy is alive and well. Your work, Lord, that will continue until you send back the king once again for us. How we pray with humility, how we pray with joy, how we pray, Lord, that it would please you to take this familiar story and disrupt our complacency. Meet us in our disconnect, help our hurting hearts, free us, Lord, from the things that imprison us, and grant, O oh God, we pray above all, that you would bring us, even this day, to a greater fulfillment of the words you promised through the prophet Zechariah, that you would make us, even us, prisoners of hope. The question, Father, before us is the question that will remain with us throughout eternity, for we will learn more and more and more and more of the glory and grace of Jesus forever and ever. Jesus, would you come and reveal more of yourself to us in this day? Lord, I pray now, as I often pray, anything that I would preach or teach that cannot be completely established by the truth and beauty and authority of your word, Lord, may it quickly fall to the ground and be forgotten so fast. But Lord, the things that I would share that approximate that which resonates in your heart, 
And you have confirmed through the testimony of Scripture, Lord, wrap these things around us, change us, liberate us, free us, forgive us, enthrall us, overwhelm us, we pray, to be a people, to the praise and to the glory of your grace, praying together in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, you have a very brief outline in your notes, and I'm going to follow that threefold affirmation this morning as we're going to think about these words. First of all, reason for hope, bound up with that great question, who is Jesus? Who is this Jesus? Secondly, we've got to talk about resistance to hope because even though it's not real obvious, a lot of us would prefer not to hope. For some of us, hoping is just too dangerous. Hoping is too unfamiliar. So we're going to talk about in Jesus' day and in our day, why do we fight hope? And then lastly, we're going to consider the reach of hope. How this very morning that, as we have often said in this marvelous family, none of us is beyond the need of God's grace and none of us is beyond the reach of God's grace. So let's consider this morning reason for hope. And if you do have a Bible or something electronic that can expand your gaze on Scripture, I want to read uh, back from Zechariah chapter 9, beginning at verse 9 all the way through verse 12. And I want to read this passage because uh, in so many ways that question, who is Jesus and why did he come into the city so unrecognized? It's really, it's bound up with this passage in Zechariah that's so pregnant with Jesus. Let me remind you, even before we read this text, who Zechariah was. Zechariah is the 11th of 12 minor prophets. And that doesn't mean he's the 11th in importance, just in the sequence of events, his position in the history of redemption comes later. He is one of the prophets that God raised up after God's sons and daughters were released from the Babylonian captivity. So after the exile, when God's children were released to come back to Jerusalem, which a lot of them did, to rebuild the temple, as delightful, as enthralling as that story seemed to be, it met a lot of resistance. Rebuilding the altar, recentering the worship of God in Jerusalem uh, was contested. And so it was a difficult season to move forward into the story. And so God raised up prophets for, um, for encouragement. And uh, Haggai was one of those prophets of restoration, and Zechariah, his contemporary, and Zechariah has been considered by many as kind of a uh, condensed version of the prophecy of Isaiah who prophesied uh, almost 200 years before Zechariah because everything you find in that massive prophecy of Isaiah you find in condensed form in Zechariah. And I think for good reason. In fact, the very name Zechariah in Hebrew means God remembers. And so in Zechariah, we find God remembering promises that God has made that God alone can keep. And, and really, that's foundation to hope. We're, we're never going to hope in ourselves. We're not going to hope in hope. We've got to hope in the God of all hope. So Zechariah shows us the things that God promised that he would be about. And those words were meant to encourage the men and women of God of Zechariah's day when there was a lull in their passion, when uh, the fears outside and the crazy on the inside moved them to forget God's story and who they were in that story. So, so much of Zechariah puts the focus on what's going to happen when this promised Messiah actually comes. And so we read later in his prophecy, Zechariah's prophecy, these words, Zechariah 9, beginning at verse 9, going through verse 12. And just hear how amazing it is that these words were given over 500 years before Palm Sunday. This is just staggering in terms of hearing how much of the Messiah, who we know to be Jesus, what was said of him. Word of the, word of the Lord for the people of God. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See. Your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, 
gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We've already heard those words in Matthew's account. See, that's a connection that needs to be seen. Jesus fulfills promises God has made. Verse 10, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule, of course, speaking of the Messiah, his rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Staggering what God said through the prophet Zechariah to beleaguered, bored, having lost their heart and passion people of God in his day. What a great image. God reminding his people of what he, God, remembers, which is meant to bring them to a new imprisonment. They already are suffering all kinds of false imprisonments, but God wants his people to enter into the Hoosgau of hope. You remember what a Hoosgau is, you old cowboy movie watchers? Hoosgau in John Wayne movies was the jail you got thrown into. Hal, you're old enough. You remember that, right? A Hoosgau. Older I get, the more I travel, the more Darlene says, honey, you got to up your game, your, your illustrations. People don't know, have any clue what you're talking about. They don't, there's a new generation don't even know who the Beatles are. you got to got to talk about Jazzy J or something. I don't know. A hoose gal is a... <laughs> See, I don't even know who I'm talking about. <laughs> but uh, the hoose gal is a jail. And, and the hoose gal of hope is what God, God wants to imprison his people to hope. Now, that's a paradox. We'll come to that. But all of this is bound up with the one that is coming to us. So let's consider this morning, the reason for hope that we have even more so than God's people in Zechariah's day, because we live on this side of the first coming of this king. Follow along with me as we ponder what is said in this Zechariah text about the one who has come to us and the one who is coming again. Who is this Jesus, Jerusalem asked on Palm Sunday? Well, according to Zechariah, here's a part of who he is. Number one of six affirmations from the Zechariah text. Jesus is the righteous king promised in the scriptures. That should be the most obvious thing that we would say today. The prophets foretold the day the king would come. We can say this morning, who is he? He's the prophesied one. He's no random rabbi. He's not someone that has just simply come in his own mission. No, the Messiah that comes prophesied as the king of peace is the God that made this world and sustains all things by the power of his word. He is the one that fulfills the prophecy Zechariah made. But let's consider more about how he is described in Zechariah and its implications for us in terms of our various imprisonments. Second thing we would say in the second part of verse 9, Jesus, along with being the righteous king prophesied in scriptures, he is the gentle king who welcomes the weary. Love that second part of verse 9. He, he is gentle and he comes riding on a donkey. That would be good news to people right now this morning that are in prison to weariness. We know when he did come and about as a incarnate, incarnate ministry, Jesus beckoned men and women just like us in this room. Come unto me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're not going to come to a king that is proud and distant and arrogant, but perchance in your weariness you will come to one who comes to us gentle, riding on the foal of a donkey. What an amazing image. He comes in on a, not the donkey's mother, but the foal. Do you understand what a foal of a donkey is? That would be an unbroken donkey. That just speaks again in a hidden fashion of the power of Jesus over creation. He stills the storm, but he even has such control over all things in his gentleness. He gentles an unbroken foal. But along with being the righteous king and the gentle king, he is the mighty king. Look at verse 10. 
Of him it is said, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. Great image, this gentle king is the mighty king who will end all war and evil. How could that possibly have been understood that day that palm branches were flying on a most unassuming, lowly, hidden Messiah coming in to the land? All evil, all war will be over. Is it not true that in our day, in the last several months in particular, we have been stirred again to cry out to our God, how long, O oh, Lord, will evil prevail? We, we just see just unconscionable evil, and we sometimes wonder, does God care? Does God know? This king understands all things. He promises that both among his people and around his people, the battle bow will be broken. In his name, all oppression shall cease one day. This is the one that comes into Jerusalem on that day. Could not possibly have seen it. Only the heart that remembers what God remembers could have possibly gone there. But Jesus is also the cosmic king. Notice what it said in the second part of verse 10. He will proclaim peace to the nations. Look at this. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Other prophet of restoration, Haggai, in his own words, put it like this. One day, the work of the Messiah will be so great that the, that the latter temple will be far greater than the former temple. In fact, one day, the work of the Messiah that starts so small and so unassuming will lead to the day when not just Jerusalem, not just the Fertile Crescent, but the entire earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of our God as the waters cover the sea. How could you possibly have seen that with someone coming in, not on a white stallion, but a little foal, young foal? How quiet he comes, how glorious he is. Along with being the righteous, gentle, mighty, and cosmic king who will restore all of creation, Jesus is also the redeeming king. Look at verse 11. The one who saves by his death, which we celebrate this very week. Verse 11. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. This one who comes knows what he is coming for. He's not expecting Jerusalem to welcome him. He is unimpressed with the hosannas because he knows those cheers at the beginning of the week will become jeers at the end of the week when they cry out, crucify him, crucify him. And that's exactly why he came. The blood of the covenant. Earlier prophets, Ezekiel and Jeremiah both, spoke of this outrageous generosity that God would bring about through the Messiah, a greater covenant, even greater than the covenant God made in the Garden of Eden, even greater than the covenant he made with Noah, even greater than the covenant he made with Moses, God would create a new covenant. He would take his law and not finger it on rocks again, but write it upon new hearts Verdant, living hearts, regenerated hearts, placing his law within us because the law would be fulfilled for us by this Savior. A new covenant would be ratified, and this one who comes on this fold knows that's why he is here. Because the joy set before Jesus, he endured the shame of the cross. The shame that has a lot of us in prison today far more than we existentially sense that we are enslaved, imprisoned to grace and in the huskow of hope. Jesus is the redeeming king who saves by his death. Lastly, Jesus is the rescuing king who imprisons us with hope. Let's look at that verse again, verse 12. Return to your fortress. God, God is saying this to his people that are back in the land, but they're, 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 they're 
on the premises, but they become stranger to the promises. Return to your fortress, a fortress that we would know today in our position in the story as the gospel itself. Return to the gospel, O men and women of Middle Tennessee. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now, I will restore twice as much to you. Do you realize how absolutely insane that is? God speaking to a people, even his own people, who are worthy of judgment. God is saying, I'm not just going to do something great for you. I'm going to up the ante. I'm going to double it. Right now in your heart and my heart, that meets resistance. We want that to be true. But a lot of us are still allergic, so allergic to the grace of Jesus. Even those of us who love it. And I put myself in that company, in that economy. There are still parts of my heart and story that I, I still think if you knew about that part, Father, surely you would give me the left foot of fellowship. So I'm going to ignore it. The Lord is commanding us to get out of these other crazy places of chains and bonds and slaveries and come to our true home that has been won for us. So in light of this incredible picture of the righteous king, the gentle king, the mighty king, the cosmic king, the redeeming king, and the rescuing king, let's talk about resistance. Here we have seen clearly reasons for hope. There is reason for the most dark heart in this room to hope, but it has nothing to do with your circumstances, nothing to do with sunshine, nothing to do with anybody in your world changing, but it's entirely bound up with who this Jesus is. How do we understand resistance then? Res the things that imprison us. Consider some of the imprisonments of the Roman world and the city of Jerusalem into which Jesus rode. So Jesus comes into Jerusalem that day, and he is fulfilling the promise and the command for one and all alike to become prisoners of hope. Well, what's the resistance? What, what, what is the opposition? What is this competition? What is the competition that enslavement to hope has? Consider the world of Jesus' day and its parallels to ours. Well, here are some of the imprisonments of the Roman world into which Jesus rode. The power and pleasures of sin. As decadent as our culture is becoming, it pales in comparison with first century Rome. Sexual obsession was the rule rather than the exception. Excesses of all kinds were the order of the day as in our day. So this theme of, of the king who comes to set prisoners free, what is he up against? Well, uh, the pleasures of sin for a season. And some of us know what that feels like. A lot of us in this room, thank God for a church that has given us since our inception in 1986 freedom to own what a mess we are. Some of us know that that mess has taken us into hedonism and pleasure and the confusion of sexual fulfillment with, with what I'm really longing for. It is to a world of Caesars with, 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 with their own little harems and their concubines and, and hideous other expressions, a brokenness of something so dear to our being that Jesus says, I'm coming for you, for you. What else is true of that first century world? Other imprisonments competing with imprisonment to hope. The fear of death and dying. This absolutely boggles my mind, but consider the statistics. The median life expectancy in ancient Rome, hear this, the median life expectancy in ancient Rome of Jesus' day was 25 years old. Thus giving rise to the mystery religions of Greece and the Roman world and a lifestyle of either stoicism, a philosophy of fatalism and personal resolve, or Epicureanism, a life of eating, drinking, and merrymaking because tomorrow you die. See, Epicurus was not exaggerating. When you only might have 25 years in life, you're going to cram as much as you can in. That's the world into which Jesus came, into which, over which he wept. You remember how Luke, a part of his account of Palm Sunday, Jesus comes into the city and he weeps over it. He's hearing the cheers and he is in tears. And, 
In Luke 19, I think it is, Jesus says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you unto myself as a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. If only you had known, listen to this, Jesus said, if only you had known what would give you peace. We get enslaved to what we think will give us peace. Because you see, there's a giant vacuum in our soul that wants to hope because we want shalom. We want the good, the true, and the beautiful. And yet we just, it's beyond our reach. Well, in the Roman world, if you did not grab it quick, you would die. Maybe some of us are enslaved to the fear of death and dying. Jesus has come to set us free from the fear of death and dying. What else was true of that world that we find parallels with? Other imprisonments competing with imprisonment to hope. The anxieties and weariness of broken politics and government. Does that sound familiar? You live in a world and you find yourself, and I think probably a percentage of us in this room would say, we find ourselves defaulting to anger more quickly when we think about politics than, than you know, many other things. We don't like corruption of any kind. We want to be able to trust. We want to be able to trust. Well, let me tell you, Jesus on that Palm Sunday came into a world of political corruption that makes our government look like a Sunday school party. So either Jesus can deliver the goods, either he will be a king, that in time will be revealed as the king of kings and lord of lords. He is either the king of whom John wrote in Revelation who has the hearts of all the kings in his hand, or we do despair. 2016 will be voting on another president. I promise you folks, I don't care who sits in the Oval Office, it's who who sits on the throne of eternity that is our surety. Let's put our hope in the right place. Let's don't imprison our hearts to any political party, but to the king of glory that has come for us and reigns right now. Two more, as I think about the world into which Jesus rode that day. Imprisonments that are grabbing at us, imprisonments that we're grabbing for ourselves and our blindness and stupor and unbelief. The blindness of pride and self-righteousness, though Israel should have known better, contemporary Jews were allergic to a dying Savior and free grace as a way of salvation, preferring the rigors of religion and law-keeping righteousness. It's important that we see that form of imprisonment right alongside of the deepest sexual bondage, the greatest cynicism over politics, the fear of death, a lifestyle of Epicureanism. We've got to see that self-righteousness, religion, pragmatism, moralism are just as deadly and just as powerful of imprisonments keeping us from Jesus as anything else. Because some of us, that is the easiest place we go, and it empowers us to look down at everybody else. See, the devil doesn't care if we are Pharisees growing our long, curly little things and decorating our phylacteries with Sunday school perfect attendance pins. He didn't care if we choose that route or absolute sexual addiction. He doesn't care as long as we stay away from Jesus. And for some of us this morning, that is an imprisonment that's harder to see. In Luke 15, it's obvious that it was a lot harder for the elder son in the Luke 15 story to see, to hear, to know the music of the gospel than his very broken way out there younger brother. There's something intoxicatingly deadly about religion. And Jesus grieved and wept more bitter tears and had more passionate things to say about those that stayed and fueled their allergy to grace by their self-righteousness than anything else. One more as we begin to wind this word forward to where we are today in this room. One more form of resistance to hope that Jesus surely anticipated as he came. Maybe this one will grab some of our attention because The other things just don't resonate. Let's see if this one does with some of us. Another form of resistance to hope 
would be the chains of guilt and shame. Jesus knew that his week would end with his death on the cross and his disciples in disarray and shame. Let's just fast forward to the end of the week, and in truly, I hope as much as possible, you will be able to take advantage of an amazing passion week planned for you as a church family. And you will, as we go further into the week, hear these things. But let's don't wait, let's don't wait till Monday, Thursday. Let's don't wait till Good Friday to understand the power of shame. Can you imagine that night that Jesus disrobed himself and he washed the feet of disciples that he knew not just Peter, but all of them would scatter and betray him. There are few powers that can be more blinding than the power of shame. But Jesus knew he was coming for the shamed because within Days of this moment on the back of that unbroken foal of a donkey, he would despise the shame. The shame of the cross because of the joy set before him. What's the joy set before Jesus? In his heart knowing that the God who remembers has promised to have a family redeemed from every single race, tribe, tongue, and people group, including us. The joy that Jesus had before him that moved him to despise the shame of the cross, which is our guilt, our shame, your guilt, my guilt, your shame, my shame, the disconnect, the disillusionment, the despair that we know. Jesus had joy anticipating the power of the gospel in your life. takes us lastly to the reach of this hope be so easy to kind of say theoretically spot on pastor good good work in the text and what an easy way out we we don't we don't need to high five each other because hey it's fifth sunday we get to the restaurants before anybody else today (laughs) this is awesome no, let's just camp out here. You're not, you're not in a hurry, right? You got a few more minutes for the reach of hope? All right, let me ask you this. Let me ask myself this. Let's acknowledge, back to the text of Zechariah, let's acknowledge the waterless pits. Now, what is that? Zechariah spoke of this image. God is going to rescue his people, those who are yet to be his people, And those who are his people, God is, through the work of the Messiah, God is going to rescue us from waterless pits. What is a waterless pit? It's a deep hole in the ground that holds no life. And in Scripture, waterless pits come at us in many different directions. There are waterless pits that you've been pushed into, like Joseph, remember when his brothers threw him into a waterless pit? There are waterless pits that you get pushed into by evil. Dark places. You cannot get out. You cannot climb the walls. There's no ladder. There's waterless pits that you simply inadvertently fall into. You just didn't see it coming. Little flirting around with this and that and whatever else. And then you find yourself like, is it Burr Rabbit that got in the tar pit? Uncle Remus, is that right? What an image. You get in there and you're just so free and fancy and you can't get free. And then there are waterless pits that we jump in. Life gets so hard sometimes you just want to disappear. And if you have never been there, let me back up. If you've never had the freedom to say you have been there, you have that freedom. You get pushed into things And you can get defined by the anger. You can be more resentful about having been pushed than to begin to cry for mercy. You can be so shamed by the fact that you didn't see it coming, but you got yourself bound up, and you end up like me trying to be your own savior. How can I spin it, fix it, etc.? The reach of hope meets us right there. 
And the fortress to which Jeremiah, excuse me, the fortress, well, Jeremiah did speak about it, but much later, Zechariah spoke about it. The fortress to which we are called today, either for the first time or for the 1137th time, is the gospel. Two questions I would like to ask you this morning, and then we're going to pray. And then we're going to sing another song. Is that right? We got one more song? I have missed your fanny so much. <laughs> Actually, not that part of you, but just your, you. I'm sorry. Darlene and I were sitting there saying, oh, my goodness. We miss you. We miss you, all of you. I'll say it again. As I said the day we installed David, I had nothing to do with it. But if I could have handpicked your next pastor, it would be David Cassidy. So thankful. All right, lest we get into, I'm kind of uh, losing the moment here. Let me get us back on. Y'all are familiar with my ADD. You know how that works. But two very important questions right now. Very important. And this is, if, if you were the only person in the room right now, I would, ask, I would look in the eye of every one of you and ask these two questions. Number one, are you running from a subpoena to hope, fearful of what hope may require of you? Let me tell you what I mean by that. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but some of us have uh, had court orders before to show up and to pay the penalty of indiscretions. Is that a flight, flight way to say it? And sometimes there's a little time to get ready for incarceration. Is that, what do they call that, David? Is there a period between when you, the court, the judge says you're guilty and you got four months or three months or two weeks to get your stuff together? Is it, do they have a name for that? Whatever. Well, it's a period, <laughs> but somebody's going to show up. Somebody's going to show up and take you to prison. Holy Spirit is knocking on your door to take you to prison. Will you answer the subpoena? Or are you afraid to hope? Why might you be afraid to hope? Could be absolutely the fear of losing control. You know what? Again, those of us, and we've shared a lot of stories in our years together, some of us that have been harmed deeply, it's simply safer not to hope. Look, don't look at anybody but Jesus. He's the one that came on the foal of a donkey for you. He knows every single story, circumstance, abuse, violation. He knows it all. And that's why he came to you and did not whistle for you to come over here. Hope. Will you answer the subpoena to hope today? Or would you prefer being shackled to something else that leads me to the last question for i pray alongside of are you running from a subpoena to hope fearful of what it might require of you secondly are you trying to break out of the prison of hope preferring to live and listen to this are you in that prison of hope but right now maybe you identify with jonah the idea of a one-way ticket from Tarshish away from the will of God seems so preferable than being locked up to God's hope. Are you trying to break out of the prison of hope, preferring to live shackled by the chains of anger, self-pity, and contempt? A lot of us know people that have gotten old and bitter and alone. That is not the story you have to live. I know some of us want justice. But what does God say to us about justice? Justice is mine. Revenge is mine. Don't be old and bad. Likewise, are we trying to get out of the prison of hope and be shackled to pleasure, freedom, and control? Oh, really? Oh, really? Control? like you ever had any? Can I take just a couple of minutes to pray for us and then David, if you'll lead us. Father, thank you. 
for the truth of your word, the power of the gospel, the reach of your hope. Lord, right now, you know every single heart in this room. You know those of us that are still peering over the fence of the Christian message, and we're, we found a community like Christ's community where it's safe to kind of try it on. Lord, maybe this would be the day when we don't try to jump over that fence, but come through a wide open door called grace. Father, perchance today there are some men and women that do not know the King of glory and grace, Jesus. Lord, draw them right now to yourself. Jesus, you came to them and for them. Whether right now it is the fear of death or the fear of living, whether it is a secret sin that someone feels like would absolutely forbid the reception of mercy and grace, Lord, draw new sons and daughters to yourself, Father, today and this week. But Lord, I know I speak to an overwhelming majority of sons and daughters, as in Zechariah's day, that do know you. And yet, Lord, life has been hard. Didn't see certain things coming, reversals, loss of health, loss of name, loss of position, too much prosperity that numbed our heart to the true riches of Jesus. Lord, there are, there are stories going on right now. This room is, is full of imprisonments, full of shackles just because we're here, because I'm here. And we know Jesus in that blessed day when in public ministry you stood up and you grabbed the scroll and you rolled it to Isaiah's word and you proclaimed in that synagogue that day, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to proclaim the year of the Father's favor. Jesus, we speak of your favor today because you took the disfavor of the cross for us. We dare to believe that none of us is beyond the reach of hope. Come and cut through the illusion of pleasure. Cut through the bondage of the ways we medicate pain that you would gladly redeem. And Lord, for those of us just so hurt we can't see beauty, so disillusioned, so spent on Christians and religious types. Lord, cut through all that fall door all right now. Uh, Lord, you have come to set prisoners free, and you will succeed. But Lord, let us know that a subpoena is not an invitation. We are the fools that would pull out that GPS that Tim spoke about earlier and plot an escape route from hope. Lord, it's just a matter of time. Hallelujah, you will break us. Hallelujah, you will humble us. Hallelujah, Lord, you will reel our hearts back into the fortress of the gospel. Why not today? Why not this week? Oh, God of resurrection and hope, we bow before you now, praying that by your Holy Spirit, you would make the gospel believable and beautiful to all of us. And that, Lord, even as we stand to sing your praise now, you would give us some clarity about what imprisonments we right now are actually choosing over hope. And let us see the folly. But, Lord, beyond the folly, let us see your open arms, your might, your mercy, your grace for rebels, fools, and self-righteous idolaters just like Scotty Smith. See this, and we pray with hope and expectation in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Did you receive the Lord's benediction this morning? Now may the God of all hope establish your heart in the benevolent and gracious chains of his mercy and lead you in paths of peace for Jesus' sake. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's sing together.